Welcome to the Stanford Cancer Institute Frontiers in Oncology uh, series. And today you've uh, tuned in for a very special celebration. Uh, today, it's my honor. I'm David Miklos. I'm the chief of the Stanford Blood Marrow Transplantation and Cellular Therapy Division. And I'm the third chief in this uh, progression. Today, we're going to honor the first chief. Uh, could you place a slide of Dr. Carl Bluma on the screen, please? Carl was born in Germany in 1937. He completed his education at the University of Freiburg, Germany, followed by residency, two fellowships, one in Freiburg and the second at the City of Hope National Medical Center in Duarte, California, where he first joined the California crowd. His mentor was Ernest Butler, and he recruited him to establish the Allergen Egg Transplant Program at the City of Hope, where the first transplant was performed in May 1976. It was around 1987 when Stan Trier and Ron Levy jumped in the car, went down to LA and uh, actively recruited Carl. I've heard those stories many times. Uh, they uh, brought Carl to Stanford to start his second transplant program. Uh, he and his team performed Stanford's first transplantation November 2nd, 1987. And since then, over 6,500 patients have received transplants at Stanford. And this year, 2021, I'm proud to tell you, there'll be 640 transplants being done at Stanford uh, Division Blood and Marrow. Uh, Stanford program is nationally recognized for both excellent patient care and the significant contributions to the science of bone marrow transplantation. But I would also argue that um, those who know Carl understand that Carl built a team. And um, Carl's influence was uh, from the beginning, uh, the building of the supportive team focused on talents of the patients, the importance of the family, the quality of the patient's lives, the transplant survivors, uh, the battle against graft versus host disease and recognizing the long, long survivorship uh, challenges that all of our patients face. He recognized the distinction of each of the people in the group and he left a, a lifetime of vast accomplishments. Uh, he uh, started a journal, worked uh, along with Richard and others to begin the society. Uh, he is remembered for many professional achievements. Uh, and of course, um, his wife uh, survives him, Vera, who's a friend of mine, and their children, Carolyn, Philip, and five grandchildren. So uh, circa 2000, uh, Rob Nagren, Nelson Chow, Vera, Laura Adams, they celebrated Carl's 60th birthday and Nelson roasted Carl. And it's those notes that provide me a little bit of uh, material what I'll call Carl's maxims. And I wanna share three of my favorites. Um, uh, number one is um, that uh, optimism is a force multiplier. Carl was a very optimistic man. And number two was that uh, the day that the uh, team stops to work together, uh, you really accomplish nothing. Plans, uh, plans don't accomplish anything. Endeavors succeed or fail because of the people involved. Carl believed in people, and only by attracting the best people do you accomplish great deeds. And then finally, and this is a, something that I have to remember frequently, the day that the members of the team stop bringing you their problems is the day they stopped uh, trusting you. They've lost confidence, and they uh, conclude you don't care or that you're not capable. So uh, them not bringing their problems, that's a failure of leadership. So I think about Carl. I think about his ability to build a program out of nothing. And... Um, and I'm gonna transition uh, and celebrate more of that tonight with our faculty and uh, Vera and our long-term uh, founders of the BMT program. But now I want to uh, thank Dr. Richard O'Reilly for joining us today to help uh, celebrate uh, Carl's contributions. Richard is the Claire L. Toe Chair in Pediatric Oncology Research at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And Richard is the former chair of the Department of Pediatrics. As chief of the bone marrow transplantation service in both Department of Peds and Medicine, Richard pioneered transplantation for patients who did not have sibling donors. The Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, Dr. O'Reilly, they introduced the use of marrow transplants from unrelated donors, and thereafter T-cell depleted transplants from half-matched donors, that is haploidentical donors, who have uh, lethal immune deficiencies, and this was his area was pediatric specialty. In 1994, he introduced the use of transplanted donor T cells for the treatment of EBV induced lymphomas. And currently, he continues to evaluate uh, the use of these adoptive uh, T cells from third party healthy donors for viral infections, leukemias, conducting many phase one, phase two trials to bring these forward to the benefit of patients across the country. And this will be the topic of today's conversation. I thank Richard. A good and a great friend, a lifelong friend of Carl Bluma, for helping to celebrate today with us. And uh, look forward to 
uh, a great uh, conversation. Thank you, Richard. Thank you a lot, Dave. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, I wish I were with you uh, right now. Uh, hopefully, uh, in years to come, it'll be a calm post-COVID period where we can get together in this particular realm. Carl and I were very close friends when we were founding uh, head editors for the BBMT journal early in its going and early in the development of the society. Um, we both um, thought a lot to say the least of our families. Um, his son, Philip, is in uh, a composer in classic mu classical music. Uh, my son, Stephen, is a composer in popular music. Both have done well, but at the, that time they were young kids. And at that particular time, we were sort of uh, uh, sharing you know, concerns, but by the same token, it was a mutual admiration because uh, Philip's work is absolutely gorgeous. And I happen to love what my son's songs are all about. So that's both sides has worked out really well. Um, he and Vera were really extraordinary. I still remember uh, times when Vera would periodically uh, take Carl's uh, uh, favorite car. That was always a big concern on his part, but uh, uh, it all worked out uh, very well in that regard. If Vera, if you're there, my love to you and and um, you guys, um, you wish I were there just, just to say hello. So I'm gonna talk today um, a bit about um, bringing you up to date in terms of the cell therapies as we're here and, and telling you a little bit about uh, both those things which work very well and also uh, our attempts to figure out uh, those instances in which they don't work out very well. And the intent of that is to try to make this into something that is going to be um, useful for the future. I understand from various and uh, collaborators out at Stanford that you guys are also uh, pushing very aggressively into cell therapies. So some of these may be um, useful to you as you, as you go forward. Uh, so how do we switch over now? Here we go. Oh, so cool. And so, um, That's perfect, Richard. Thank you. You got it. Perfect. Okay. So, um, I have to tell you um, that um, Atara came in and licensed our banks of EVV specific T cells, uh, and I've received royalties as a result of this. Uh, and I've received research funds from Matara uh, early on in terms of the uh, EBV work. So just to be sure that you guys all know that. So that which I say, you can, as one of my pathology teachers once said, you know, you, you listen, you, you repeat, and then throw it over your left shoulder like some salt. Um, all of you know about EBV lympho lymphoproliferative disorders. Uh, these occur in marrow transplants on modified grafts from 1% to 3%. Uh, particularly in the cords, it's about three to five percent. T depleted, it can be as high as five to seven percent. But as you can see, among the solid organ transplants, heart, lung in particular, uh, you can have a significant incidence of eight to ten percent, uh, whereas the kidney grafts now about two percent. The key point here is uh, that um, if you treat them in the early stages of viremia, you can get very nice responses, clearly in the eighty percent range. If you have overt disease, about half of the time it works, but the problem is uh, only half of those uh, really turn out to be durable. If they're refractory, uh, they are oftentimes uh, lethal. And in terms of overall survival among the solid organ transplants, it's been about two years. At two years, it's about 33%. We introduced the idea of using unselected cells um, as DLI for the treatment of these uh, in 1994. Um, and at that time, uh, basically my good friend, uh, Malcolm Brenner wrote a commentary and he was absolutely right on that if I use unselected cells, I'm going to get into a problem of having potential graft versus host disease. And from that time on, he, his group and our group uh, basically pushed very hard in terms of the use of EBV specific T cell populations um, derived from the transplant donor. 
and their group were particularly focused on prophylaxis and show, have shown very convincingly in over 100 cases that they actually can, in fact, eliminate the problem of uh, post-transplant EBV lymphomas. Uh, we focused more on uh, treatment, uh, and uh, they've had also some uh, treatments in this regard um, because of the fact that uh, this is still a very rare uh, complication of the transplant period. The key variable that will come back time and time again is the way we're using the cells is these are cells derived uh, from, the, from the blood. What you do is you transform uh, B cells to make EBV BLCLs. And these are now autologous antigen presenting cells cultured in the presence of acyclovir. Uh, they don't uh, give off much in the way of a virus. These EBV BLCLs can then be used to sensitize T cells from, again, the same blood sample. You have in red the allo-specific cells. And the key variable is that over time, in a period of around 28 to 35 days, you see a marked depletion of the alloreactive cells and a marked expansion of the EBV-specific cells. And this is just to look at the characterization. These cells are most often going to be CD8 populations, but they always have CD4. They also always have uh, populations of memory, uh, uh, memory uh, T cells uh, and also uh, stem cell-like uh, T cells in this particular realm. When you look at their cytotoxicity, they exhibit uh, reactivity against the donor uh, BLCLs. Uh, they don't have K562 killing. They don't kill mismatched BLCLs. They lack alloreactive cell populations. And this is shown also in the context of, of uh, uh, CTL precursors, where again, you can see a very low incidence of allo CTLPs. This translates into a very, very low risk of graft versus host disease. And numerically, uh, this is looking at the EBV uh, mode. Here, we're looking at HLA matched donor lymphocyte, uh, unselected donor lymphocytes. And you can see by CTL precursors, about 17 uh, per million uh, T cells are EBV specific, 97 uh, per million uh, are, allo are allo specific. And you can see the doses that you would be giving a patient. And this is associated with a significant instance of GBH. In contrast, when you use the EBV CTLs after 28 to 35 days, what you see is this marked enrichment of EBV specific CTL precursors and a marked depletion of allo specific cells such that the total dose that a 70 kilogram person would get would be about 350. And this has really not been associated with graft versus host disease. We early on did uh, studies looking at the patients who received um, these EBV specific cells um, from uh, their transplant donor. And this is just summarizes that. And as you can see, um, with the EBV specific cells, uh, no uh, problems with graft versus host disease and really a, an equivalent uh, incidence of CR and PR. And the striking feature there, uh, as well as what I'm gonna talk about, is the durability of these responses. The limitations, of course, if you use transplant donor, are much the same as if you use autologous CARs. It, it takes time to make these. In the context of an allo transplant, if you're going to deplete the alloreactive cells, you want about uh, 28 to 35 days at least you need four weeks to make the EBV CTLs. You need another four weeks or more to generate the T cell line. So timing is a problem. Sometimes the donor availability is limiting. This is a case in terms of the unrelated donors because you're not allowed to really take cells until significantly after the transplant. And then the other limitations I'll get into, namely in terms of HLA restriction and uh, re recognition. There have now been a series of, of groups that have looked at the use of third-party donor derived EBV CTLs. Um, and, uh, but as you can see, the number of cases in each of these series is extraordinarily small. Uh, we've developed a bank of 330 of these uh, donor derived EBV specific T cell lines. They're all consented for third-party use and they're well characterized in terms of HLA type, their EBV specificity, and HLA restriction, and they're all GMP grade. And the key variable is they have a very high applicability. About 98% of the cases um, that are referred to us for transplant 
we can find a donor if we need it. We initially um, looked at this, in fact, in 2012, this is a young man who received a, an allo transplant specifically for T-cell lymphoma that was EBV negative. Um, and he received a cord blood graft and developed an EBV lymphoma involving his cord cells. Uh, he received rituximab. Uh, despite the rituximab, he continued to have quite striking um, EBV copies in the circulation. Um, and the limitation was he really, as I'll show you, really developed severe disease, particularly involving the gut. Uh, and Juliet Barker was convinced that he was going to die. And so what we then did was to ask the question, could we use a third party donor? And in this case, what you can see here is that this third party donor is homozygous for A1, B8, C7, and GR3. And the, both the core blood and the patient shared the B8 and the CO701, and these were the restricting elements in terms of the T cells that you can see here by the cytotoxicity. What we then did was to infuse a million T cells per kilogram into this man at this point in successive dosing. As each, after each dosing, you see this increment in, in terms of the circulating CTL precursor populations. Um, and with that, as you can see, uh, this is the way he looked just before. He had really severe disease up in the mouth area. He had also a series of nodes in the mesentery as well as the gut, such that he was losing about uh, two units of blood per day in the stool. Um, as you can see now, you give the T cells um, and you see progressive uh, elimination of the disease. Uh, and he continues at the present time. I talked to him a couple of weeks ago um, he's a teacher up in the, the wilds of New Hampshire and does extremely well and is perfectly fine and has never seen his EBV since. Uh, we have now transplanted a significant number. This is a small number. This represents our series only. Um, so what you're seeing here is, um, uh, back here, we've done the first series with 13 organ transplant, 34, marrow transplants, the key variable thing that I want to look at is all of these patients that received um, rituximab and in the organ transplant recipients, 11 of the 13 had received CHOP-like uh, regimens. Uh, six of them had actually received three regimens and they were refractory to each. That, so they still had progressive disease uh, during this time, okay? The way we are treating these patients uh, is uh, that they get one dose per week um, on week one, two, and three. You then watch them, and then you can give secondary doses beginning for the sixth, seventh, and eighth week. And the endpoints that we had for this were infusion-related toxicity response, in particular looking at EBV, and then uh, alterations in circulating EBV precursors. The toxicities associated with these EBV CTLs have been really low. There are no infusion-related toxicity whatsoever in this uh, series. One patient developed a grade one skin rash that responded to topical steroids. There's no instances of rejection reactions, um, and we did not have any evidence of cytokine release. So this is a very different type of circumstance. And you might also worry, since you're giving third-party cells, uh, are the grafts themselves going to maintain their integrity? And Importantly, we did not have graft failures or de novo cytopenias. The responses can be really quite striking. This is a recipient of a T depleted graft who developed this relatively early after transplant, this massive EBV lymphoma. This patient got a, a single course of the EBV T cells and was cleared over the course of two months. But most of the time, what you see is that in contrast to the um, uh, transplant donor where you usually give one dose, they expand and you get your full response there. What you see in the um, third party cells is a cumulative response to successive uh, uh, courses of the drug. And, or, and, and so as a consequence of this, when you're giving the EBV specific T cells, uh, what we usually plan on is a, in, works out to be a median of around two cycles to achieve the maximum response. And this is shown here. 
This is a patient who had rituximab, still was positive here. You then give now the cells. There were no evidences of EBV specific T cells. You now give cells. You can see then, once again, this increment in terms of the EBV CTLs. And what you see here is uh, through this week four, as you now see, you still have massive evidence of disease, both up in the neck as well as in the gut. And then by week 10, after the first course, uh, you see marked reduction and then continued improvement and complete clearance of the disease. What you also see in the peripheral blood is an increment in terms of EBV CTL precursors in those who have a complete or partial response shown here. But strikingly enough, also some of the patients who have stable disease also have increments, whereas the patients who don't respond usually have no response whatsoever that you can detect in the peripheral blood. The striking feature here again is for those who fail to respond, there's a sharp fall off. Uh, these patients have a, again, a median survival of uh, less than six months, but those patients who respond long-term either with stable disease or with um, a complete response or partial response have a very good uh, over 80% likelihood of long-term survival. The clinical features that are associated um, with uh, responses, what we do see is a significant difference both in the marrow transplants or particularly in the marrow transplants, less so in the organ transplant in terms of rituximab only versus rituximab plus chemotherapy. But remember, all the chemotherapeutic persons uh, generally have had this. So, it, you know, that this is a significant difference, but we only have two people who only got, you know, uh, the rituxan. So what you can say is, if you have rituxan plus chemotherapy, uh, you're less likely to have a response. Um, you also have a significant fault, uh, issue here if you have extra nodal disease in the in the in the group, uh, particularly among the organ transplant recipients. Those patients are at higher likelihood of having a non-success. Strikingly, however, the brain is an uh, area where these T cells can go. Uh, this is a patient here who had RT. This is a patient with no. Uh, radiation therapy to the CNS. And what you can see here is um, that when you give these T cells, we have 19 patients who had evidence of CNS disease. Um, eight had residual disease after CNS RT of whom 10 of eight of 10. Um, and when we look at the re overall responses, uh, we have um, in this particular circumstances, uh, four patients with partial and six with complete remissions and overall a long-term survival of uh, 53%. So these cells are active and actually can get at sites uh, that otherwise uh, might be uh, limiting uh, to other types of therapies. As a result, if you look at the long-term uh, survival, uh, it has been really quite good. These again are SOT cases that have received both rituxan and chemotherapy in 11 of the 13. And as you can see, overall responses, uh, it ultimate would be 65% for the marrow transplant recipients who are all flunked for Tuxan and 54% for, uh, for the solid organ uh, patients who receive chemo and uh, for Tuxan. We've continued to accrue. We now have about 50 marrow transplant cases overall objective, uh, either CR or PR is 62% in this particular grouping. Um, and you can also see in the, um, both in the subgroup with rituxan alone, where 86% of the people have responded, it's 17, so doubled uh, the number of, or increased the number of cases that we have. Um, and as you can see, 58% of the rituximab plus chemotherapy are doing well with the CR plus PR. Now what I'd like to also now switch gears and also talk about the CMV CTLs, and then we'll get into the issues of what is limiting features for both types of these, of these, EP, of these uh, 
require specific T cell populations. And again, adoptive therapy with transplant donor CMV CTLs started off back a long time ago, 1995, with Stan Riddell showing what he could do with clones of CMV specific cells. And he had very, very nice uh, prevention in terms of, of uh, prevention of CMV disease. In terms of treatment, again, the relative number of these cases is small, but each of these series shows a really quite striking response by uh, using uh, either CMV lysate or um, uh, uh, streptomers or um, uh, T cells sensitized with a peptide mix or a peptide pool. Now I'd like to briefly uh, tell you a little bit about though is our bank. In this particular circumstance, we have 138 of these lines. And these again are all consented for third party use. And we've actually looked at all the epitopes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. The way we generate these cells is to use, uh, the, again, the T cells, put them on dendritic cell populations that are loaded with a um, pool of peptides that are 15 mers, and they have um, 11 amino acid overlaps that span the sequence of CMV P65. And again, we culture them for a period of 28 days, uh, and then uh, we can assess these cell populations in terms of their uh, specificities, as well as their uh, other phenotypic and functional features. We can also arrange um, subpools of the peptides that we have, in such a way uh, that in real terms, you can measure on the X and the Y axis, you can see, for example, a single peptide that is present in number 23 and number two, or number three, for example. Um, and this is one of the advantages because you can rapidly map the epitopes uh, that are being recognized by the T cells. This, unfortunately, the way we're showing it here, you can't see this, but if you put it in the grid, it, actually comes out. And as you can see um, here in this particular population, uh, a population of CD8 cells uh, here and here. And this was uh, such that you had a single um, epitope in uh, uh, peptide number 82, and it is um, presented by uh, HLA B35, and that's shown here. So if you look at B35, and what you're doing then is you're taking either the epitope or the whole pool, you can put it on a series of lines that share with the T cell donor a single HLA allele. And I initially thought this was gonna give us a tremendous amount of background, but it doesn't. And out it comes is the B3503 as the restricting element. Here you see a population of CD4 cells uh, that are reactive against this peptide. And this peptide is presented by a DRB10402 shown here. What we now have is uh, we look at this of the 138, uh, there are 188 HLAs that are present in the bank, but the total presenting are 71. Uh, it's 57 that are class one, 14 of class two. But the key other point to be raised is that 88% of the lines are actually specific for only 14 epitopes that are presented by 26 HLA alleles. But the other really striking feature, uh, not something necessarily uh, overwhelming to immunogeneticists, but for virologists, it's still a little bit very, very intriguing to me, is that what you see is these are uh, presented by very common uh, prevalent HLAs with certain notable exceptions. For example, AO301, we have no lines in the bank that are restricted by AO301. But what we also find uh, nevertheless is that 80% of the lines are restricted by one of 12 of the most prevalent of the HLA A or B alleles in the population of the United States. And as a result of that, if we now go back and just take a series of 239 transplants referred to us uh, that are matched or 137 that are non-identical or HLA partially matched, uh, what you see is a very high likelihood of being able to find a T cell that is matched for two alleles and is HLA restricted by um, an HLA that is shared 
by the patient's disease. And if we looked at 554 requests where people call in just ask prior to transplant, do you have cells available? We're able to identify uh, appropriate donors uh, for 96% of them. So what it's saying is because of this prevalence, we're actually able to identify uh, donors for over 96% of individuals. This is looking now at a series of 59 patients that we treated with the CMV uh, populations of cells. And as you can see, these patients have been heavily treated. The median number of courses is three. Um, and what we see here is only seven patients that received a single uh, antiviral drug. And they received, this is all in the pre latermavir period. Furthermore, 55% of these were um, exhibiting uh, genetic evidence of resistance to the drugs. Uh, they were also predominantly um, T depleted grafts. They were also predominantly HLA non identical grafts. And each of these features have been associated with a higher risk of cumulative mortality associated with uh, CMV disease. Again, the type of approach uh, is you give one dose per week. For three weeks, you wait. And then day week six, seven, and eight, you give it additional doses. What's different about this trial versus some of the other trials in the literature is the complete response is complete clearance of viremia and biopsy proven resolution of invasive disease that you'd expect. But the key variable here is we're not talking about 50% reduction. We're talking about a two log 10 reduction in CEMD viral load and resolution of the clinical symptoms related to disease. That's our dem uh, our definition of a partial response. These T cells are again, as you'd expect, predominantly uh, CD8 populations. You see them both in the responders and in the non-responders. Um, you have some CD4s, but there are no significant differences by phenotype. You also see in this circumstance that the responders and non-responders have equivalent reactivity in terms of cytotoxicity, we also looked at this in terms of interferon gamma positive T cells. Um, in terms of numbers, there's no difference between responders and non responders. And again, what you see is they have little or no reactivity against mismatched populations of cells. This is the total group of um, epitopes and their HLA restrictions that were used. Uh, so the CMB specific CTLs, they're specific for 20 epitopes presented by 25 alleles, mostly HLA class one. And each dose of T cells that we're giving, so we're giving mixed T cells that have been in culture, uh, provide about 2.2 times 10 to the fourth T cells per million uh, T cells administered. And we're giving a dose of a million per kilogram. The toxicity of these things, these things have been low. The key one uh, would be, uh, in particular, the issue of hypoxia. That is an issue that you see in the patients who have uh, presented with um, uh, CMV involving the lung. We don't see infusion related uh, toxicity. We have, an, we have one patient who developed uh, graft versus Sox disease uh, late after the cells. What you usually see here is you give the third party cells. You may see an increment initially in terms of the uh, CMB PCRs, both in responders and non-responders. This is the reason why certain of the, we had about eight patients, uh, not among the 59, but an additional eight patients, which we, are, we couldn't say that they responded necessarily to the T cells because this made the clinician um, very nervous and they added antivirals. But all the rest were, were without. But you can see this spike and then it drops off as the T cells come in. Uh, and you're looking, um, here at the tetramer positive cells in blue, as well as the interferon gamma cells in red. What you also again see is the responders pretty much always come up, although not always in this particular setting. This is looking at interferon gamma positive cells. But some of the patients who have failed to respond have also had maximal responses that are higher than what they started off with. Um, and we're trying to look at these particular circumstances in most instances, uh, the reason is because of the severity of disease at the time they started their therapy. Overall, 
64% uh, of the patients have uh, achieved a uh, CR or a PR. 67% uh, of those who had viremia, persistent viremia, uh, that had failed to respond to at least two weeks of antivirals. And as I said, uh, most of these patients had received at least three such courses of antivirals before they came to us. Um, as you can see, overall responses uh, in the disease group, 60%. Critical point to be raised here is that the responders have done very well. And the other key variable here is that even among the partial responders, these responses have been really quite durable. There's only one patient in this series of responders who has died of CMV recurring. That's it. Um, if you look at the variety of different characteristics that have been usually associated with high-risk disease, uh, we have them in spades, but they have not affected um, the outcome. The one outcome, uh, it, the one feature about the host that has turned out to be important is that they have some evidence of CD4 cells uh, prior to the, uh, uh, the treatment. Uh, if they already have them, uh, th those patients have uh, significantly uh, done well. That means better than 50, uh, but that, that's basically it. And these patients have not had this demonstrable responses uh, prior to receiving their CMV CTLs. The other one that we'll talk about is shown here, and that is what we see is that there are certain HLA alleles where if we use HLA T cells that are restricted by HLA B35, those patients have also uh, not re responded well. So what I wanna briefly go over now are some of the issues that we can talk about. We've talked a little bit about clinical features of disease, um, but what I wanna talk about is HLA restrictions and different in, in terms of antigenic features uh, that might uh, contribute to failure and also um, the possibility of evasions that might contribute to failure. So the issue of HLA restriction is fairly clear, that if you have a T cell, it is seeing antigen in the context of HLA. If you do an HLA match transplant and use donor cells, you don't usually need to be concerned about this. But most of the transplants that we're doing are now um, HLA non-identical. And more importantly, if you're using third-party cells, these cells are also HLA non-identical. And if the T cells are restricted by an HLA allele not shared by the patient, they will not respond. We showed this early in the mouse where you could have a mouse, you're looking at the cross at the shoulders here, cross at the thighs here. And what you have is an autologous EVV lymphoma grown here, an allogeneic one which has A2 as well as EVV here. You have the EBV positive, but A2 negative uh, lymphoma. And here in the ALL, it's EBV negative, but A2 positive. You infuse the cells. What you can see is the cells go to the autologous tumor and to the AO201 a tumor. And you can see them within 24 hours in the shoulders. Not a problem. And they continue to grow. And the tumor goes away. In contrast, if you now look at the thigh, but no infiltration of the T cells and the tumor continues to grow and ultimately kills the animal. In the human condition, we got this relatively early. Here, a patient who was transplanted for EBVHLH. And I thought I was smart by making cells from the mother who is the hapo uh, disparate donor. And these cells from the mother were restricted by A1101. And in this case, we gave cells from the mother, shown here in blue, along with the rituxan. We did not see evidence of a response whatsoever. Uh, indeed, the tumor continued to grow. There's a large EBV lymphoma around the, in the wall of the stomach. And then what we did was to find that this was actually a post type. And this patient uh, does not have A11. So we were giving cells that were restricted by A1101, but it's not shown in the patient. We then switched to cells which were restricted by A2601. And when we then gave these cells starting here, 
you saw the increment in terms of the EVV CTL precursors and resolution of EVV viremia and also resolution of disease. This patient also continues well at the present time. So that has underscored the issue of HLA disparities and the importance of HLA restriction. And we have several other cases to show that as well. We also have found the T cell circumstances where we're giving T cells that are appropriately HLA restricted, but they fail to uh, uh, kill the spontaneous EVV BLCLs cultured from the patient's tumor. And what we find here is that this is not an issue of presentation because of the fact clearly they are unable to kill the patient's spontaneous BLCLs. But if we culture now the same donor's cells with populations of the uh, donor, this is the donor's own, in this, in this particular case, EBV BLCLs that have been infected with the, um, the spontaneous strain, you can see that they can kill uh, just fine in this regard. So what we're trying to find out is what's the basis for this particular one. Now, Steve Gottschalk early on showed a very nice alteration in um, a tumor uh, wherein he was able to find in this particular uh, populations of cells uh, and alterations that were caused by a specific HLA, um, I'm sorry, mutation in ebna 3 b that prevented um, the T cells from recognizing uh, the tumor. Uh, we have also looked at this at the dip. dip this is a circumstance of an HLA 1101. Um, uh, and we looked at a series of uh, T cells that were 1101 restricted. They're all reactive against 7-3B. We looked at the series of different mutations of the ebna 3 b that were associated uh, potentially with problems and identified a specific HLA restriction, uh, or I'm sorry, HLA target. This mutation cannot be seen by the A1101 ebna 3 b restricted or specific uh, cells. But it was more complicated than that. You can see the selective reactivity here, okay? This is against B95-8 transformed populations. Uh, and, uh, and here you see what happens if you have it otherwise. But what as it turns out is that in fact, this patient, not just mutation, this patient did not in fact have cells that actually um, generated M3B as a target. Uh, so despite uh, this, the populations of A1101 reactive cells were unable to see the target. They, these cells, however, um, did in fact um, express all the other antigens associated with EVV. But from these types of studies, we early evolved uh, a thought, namely, if the cells were, the T cells were unable to recognize the tumor in the context of an epitope presented by A1101, what would happen if we now generate and use T cells directed against a different HLA for A2402, for example, or B44? Um, would this potentially allow us now uh, to convert this to appropriate activity? And this is shown here, We've now done this in several cases uh, where what you're looking at is the EVV. And we gave three separate donors who were EVV specific and restricted by A1101. And in each of these instances, what we had is persistence of the EVV and persistence in terms of growth. Here's at week eight, here at week 12, you can see massive disease up here, as well as in the, in the gut. And then what we did was to switch to B4403 because these cells were capable of killing the endogenous tumor. And what we found here is that these cells, when we looked at these patients here through here, we could not find any evidence of 
A, B, or C cells in the circulation. But with the third party CTL donor D, what we found was expansion, as you can see here. And we could detect these cells by STRs in the circulation, uh, day 32 uh, post initial infusion of the donor uh, D cells. And we found them uh, further on as well. And so what we're in is now is a circumstance where these cells go in and what you see is progressive uh, elimination of disease and ultimately this patient uh, cleared. And again, this is doing well three years later. Uh, we've used this type of switch therapy uh, in eight patients. And the seven of those had at the time they were treated um, progression of disease. And four got a CR and one got a PR. So this has really changed a lot in terms of how well we've done. And so what we are increasingly then doing is if a patient shows evidence of progression after the first cycle, what we would then do is to go in and give alternative cell populations. Um, and in, that has worked very well in EBV and our experience with CMV is less, but it's also can, can uh, work there, although I would expect it to be less so, certainly because incidence of mutations in the CMV uh, PP65 are low. Now, one of the things that we mentioned at the end of the CMV um, clinical side was this striking feature. And that is, if we look at uh, 30 patients treated with AO201, 76% got a CR plus PR, BO702, BO801, B44, or anything else, they're all in the 60 to 80% of them are going to have a CR or PR. Here, strikingly, nine patients treated, none of them had a CR or a PR. Seven had aggressive progression of disease, another two with stable disease ultimately also progressed. We went back and looked at our lines, since all of the lines are derived from marrow transplant donors um, who had consented for the use of their cells also for third party uh, patients. And we asked what happens in terms of the HLA allele. And if HLA, the B35 was dominant in the T cells subsequently generated, what we find again is in the recipients of transplants from those individuals, again, um, 37 or three, it's a small number, three out of eight uh, patients fail. The striking feature again here is when we look at A2 or B7, which are dominant players. In other words, if an individual has B7, the T cells against BP65 will also always be BO702 restricted. AO201, it's the same unless they inherited um, BO702. So these two are dominant. If you now look at B35 as the dominant player, um, you have failures. If they had A2 and B7, which will then be dominant, they do fine. If this is the restricting element, they have failed as well. We've been trying to figure out what's the reason for this. Um, and so we compared the T cells, looking at interferon gamma or satellitic activity. And we really can't, there's a difference here between AO201 and B3501 statistically, but they basically are able to kill uh, appropriate um, peptide loaded targets and clearly they're as similar in terms of their numbers of interferon gamma T cells. When we also asked whether the T cells of the B35 and A2 are comparable in terms of their avidity, we, we also find is by diluting uh, dilutions of the uh, peptide, here's the NLV peptide, this is the Ipsy peptide scene. What you can see is B35 does very, very well. In fact, it looks even more avid than the AO201. But the striking feature here is that while the B35 uninfected populations uh, kill, what you basically find is that the infected populations here are not killed, whereas the AO201 uh, restricted cells kill just fine. And we found this with uh, 
this A2, we've found it with um, the B7, we've uh, looked at others. Each of them are not only able uh, to recognize, but they can each kill um, infected targets. But strikingly enough, the B35 uh, does not. And this has gotten us now to this whole issue of looking at evasions, uh, which in fact can alter either um, the presentation of HLA on the surface or can alter processing and presentation of peptides on the surface. And this has elegantly been looked at now uh, by uh, Dr. Emery's over in Munich, who has basically shown and strikingly in cells infected with a strain that expresses each of the evasions, B3501 is particularly altered. It, um, is those cells are poorly seen by the T cells in comparison uh, to looking at um, cells that have other H HLAs. In this circumstance, what you're looking at are now, these are targets that are infected with CMB, which is lacking US6 or US3. And each of these evasions reduces the sensitivity. Uh, but if you take the whole group, it's really markedly low. What you also see very clearly is when you infect these DCs, uh, you also see a really marked uh, alteration. We have the GFP positive, HLA positive populations of cells. But what you can also see is that the infected cells have a marked reduction in terms of their overall expression of HLA. And what we also see in this setting, looking at a series of patients, looking at two uh, patients, both of whom have HLA B3501 restricted populations of T cells that clearly can see IPSI loaded autologous targets shown here, or allogeneic targets, okay? But they clearly also are unable to see the infected populations of cells. In this setting, uh, in contrast to what Dr. Emery has found, we were not, not able to demonstrate that, in fact, interferon really altered that response. So what I've basically been showing is these are some of the problems that we have seen. But the other side of it, of course, is the fact that the responses that we see both in the EBV setting and in the CMV setting are really long lived. I just want to make one other thing that's really kind of critical. Uh, and that is, why do you see these durable responses, particularly in patients who have partial uh, reductions, either a partial emission of the EBV lymphoma or a reduction by two logs of the CMV and they don't require antivirals and they may maintain low level viremia, but it always stays low level without requiring additional drugs. And what we think is going on is that the initial responders that you infuse can go to these tumors, can kill cells and can cross present to via uh, host APC to new host types of T cells. These would in the transplant donor, uh, transplant setting normally be donor type or they also could be host type. So the question now comes up is, which are the players? Are these the critical players in terms of the durable response or are these the critical uh, populations? And the answer is, we don't have a good answer. Namely, we have instances in which we have seen third party cells that are, can be quite long in terms of their presence in the circulation. We have instances in which we have the transplant donor populations expanding and the host populations. How do we do this? What we're doing here is taking blood from the patient and culture them with the CMB peptides. And this is at various times after the transplant, after the patient has received the T cells. You can then take these cells, you have to culture them for 24 hours, you sort them based on interferon gamma or tetramer. And then you take these populations of cells and do them by STR analysis. And I'll just show you two or three of these things. Here's one where you can easily see 
populations of these EBV reactive uh, T cells that were from this third party donor out uh, through the cycles, first cycles of the T cell. Here we have an interesting kidney graft patient who was maintained on tacrolimus. And intriguingly enough, you can see pretty cleanly, these are the EBV reactive, these are the third party T cells by the SDRs. And what you can see is that these third party cell populations are present on um, day 21 after the first cycle, that's pretty clean. But the striking feature is we followed them subsequently and you can still see these cells 23 months later. So there are some instances in which these cells may be sustained in the circulation for extended period of time. And they clearly can have an effect. Here, we're looking at a, a patient who received a T cell depleted transplant. You're looking at these are the host pattern, the stem cell donor, the T cell donor. And what you can see in this circumstance, it's basically all donor all the way through. Here, what we see is another one. This is the recipient of a T cell depleted graft. But in fact, uh, what we find here is that these cells are actually residual host populations of cells out through at least day 120 post. This patient maintained durable engraftment. This patient went on to full uh, T, myeloid, et cetera, engraftment and is, is doing well. But in this circumstance, in the early going out through 120 to 180 days, these populations of cells, again, were residual host cells that were capable of, 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 uh, of dealing with disease. Because again, these are populations of cells that have been isolated based on their CMV reactivity. Either they generate interferon gamma or we're separating them by a tetramine. So what we're basically at right now is that these bank third-party cells clearly can provide an immediately ex an accessible source. And what we're driving towards constantly with CMV uh, as well as with the EBV is such that if we get a request, we're able to return uh, appropriate cells uh, within 24 hours. It's not quite 24 hours, but it's pretty close. Second, what we find is that these cells are from a genetically diverse population, but the fact of the matter is antigens expressed by these latent viruses are presented by prevalent HLAs. And as a result of that, we are able to find donors for over 90% of cases. Uh, third point is we, we feel that HLA restriction, because these are third party cells, they're usually not fully matched. Selecting on the basis of their HLA restriction is critical because if you don't do that, the cells will not see uh, the virus infected target. Responses to the third party T cells are durable. That is a really critical point to be raised here. Uh, and the durability uh, may be based either on the populations administered in some cases, but in most of the instances what we're talking about are actually endogenous T cells that are now encouraged uh, and ex uh, to expand and to induce long-term response. And other key point here is that in fact, these banks also allow you now in patients who have progression to switch to an alternative um, antigen uh, presented by a different HLA shared by the T cells as a restricting element and by the patient's disease. And this has also produced a significant uh, responses. Obviously, uh, this is a big effort. Um, and I wanted to particularly talk about Katja de Brobigny, who's key to this effort in terms of the uh, generation of the cells, Susan Prokop, who's now in the clinical running of, of several of these, and Aisha Hassan, who did all the work on the CMV work. And we have a lot of different uh, groups that have contributed to this effort. And I think I'll stop there and take any questions. That was fantastic, Richard. I'm sure you're hearing the applause across the entire country at this point. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to highlight again, uh, it's incredible what you've accomplished. You are the pioneer in unrelated transplantation, the pioneer in haplotransplantation, and the pioneer in CTLs. Um, and I wouldn't let anybody else tell you otherwise, Richard. Um, and then finally, I wanted to ask the first question. 
uh, you have a unique system here by looking at allogeneic HLA identical bone marrow transplant recipients. And at the same time, of course, mismatched unrelated solid organ transplanters. And this is so relevant to today's interest in allogeneic versus autologous CAR T cells. Of course, you realize this. So uh, can you make some generalizations when you look at the persistence and efficacy? I saw the efficacy was very similar, 60 and 65% when you looked at solid organ versus bone marrow. But I thought maybe you could go outside of CMV and tell us, uh, can you get better immunity, for example, against BK virus or adenovirus in hosts where you're using their own T cells, um, that would be the solid organ transplant, versus tolerized T cells and BMT. I, what can you tell us about that? That's a unique experiment where you're looking at alloreactive CTLs. This is an incredibly, I think, insightful opportunity for those of us who are thinking about allogeneic CAR Ts. Well, what, what has gotten, yeah, that's a really important question. What is getting us now as we're doing these studies particularly looking at the origin of the T cells that we're picking up um, is that we, we have several instances in which, for example, in the CMB experience, the patient is seropositive, the virus is from the patient, the donor is seronegative. You're seeing these patients being treated and they have reactivation, they go through a series of courses throughout that period, there's no evidence of a T cell derived from the transplant donor. But you now give the third party cells, you see this reduction of virus or clearance of virus, okay? And we have some instances in which you see these host T cells now emerge. So we think that, that and this is a big issue that's coming up for for us, because as you know, the people who are dealing with cytotoxic T cells right now, the biggest thing to do is to find T cells that are quote unquote going to persist, okay? So persistence is the name of the game. We're making all sorts of modifications of the T cells to ensure persistence. Yet here we're now talking about a bank of off the shelf reagents. And in many instances, we don't see persistence of the T cells that we administer. But what we see is persistence of response. I get it. I, I see what you're saying. And you're talking a little bit about this epitope spread to the endogenous T cells themselves, and you're lighting the fire. And part of that may be a function of the fact that they themselves are allergenic and maybe have enhanced capacity for um, for stimulation of the, of the populations that are there. Super. Let me jump to a couple of questions. We have really short time. Ken Weinberg, uh, again, compliments you, and he asks... Um, are the cell lines, uh, their expansion or effector function inhibited by IL-10? And do the IL-10 genes that were captured by the CMV, UL-11A or EBV, BCRF1 have a role in resistance? So give us a quick answer on that one. Don't know. Okay, good. Now, Great question, uh, Judy Shizuru asks, um, do you see CRS when you're doing this type of uh, no, cell infusion? never seen it. Never. Okay, that's interesting. And, um, and do you think that... Um, uh, you know, what's your best strategy to make your CTLs more active? Is it simple? You know, you talked a lot about HLA matching. What's your best strategy to next? You know, do you want to add cytokines? What, what are you thinking might make this work better? Uh, two aspects of it. Um, we do not have evidence that HLA matching is critical to their response. In fact, uh, we actually have something of a converse. That's an intriguing feature, number one. Number two, in terms of further modifications that would work, the query we're looking right now at is principally uh, looking at IL-15. First, in terms of the initial expansion in vitro, and also, uh, you know, the, the, the question that is coming up is, uh, is it possible that we could use um, cells modified to express IL-15? The answer is, yeah. Or could we give exogenous style 15? Sure, absolutely. And our last question here contributed by Rob Negrin. Uh, great talk. What do you think is limiting the extranodal disease response? I mean, we saw some of your responses in the EBV with the brain, but what do you think is limiting this? And uh, how important do you think the microenvironment is in this?